Hello and welcome to this week's Happy Maths Hour. This is Pythagoras Theorem Story 2. Last year, week we dealt with the history and today, Tony, what well, are we there's doing? a bit more. There's a bit more history, um, but we're going to look at one of the proofs of Pythagoras' theorem, which is a jigsaw proof. And uh, I hope you'll all like it. We're just, it's not going to be difficult at all. Uh, we're just going to do a lot of chatting about things, aren't we, Caroline, as we usually do? Yeah, happy mass sounds very relaxed. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so what you see in the middle of the screen there is a, a couple of the solutions to this uh, to this jigsaw and uh, Caroline's recently done this with a, a class of year nine haven't you Caroline yeah. sort of yeah 15. And it was, yeah uh, 14 15 year olds and is it about 14 ish and they they enjoyed it at the 13 14 year olds and um, they, 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 it's people that, well, this wasn't a class that tends to be interested, but some aren't, and they were all interested in doing this activity, every single one of them. Can you hear a, 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 a noise, Caroline, in the I background? I can hear a printer. I can hear a printer printing. It's okay. It's okay. It's not. It's not no, big... I haven't got a printer on here. Oh, really? Yes. It sounded like a printer. Oh, dear. Oh, okay. Well, I, we can't, can't do much about that, actually. I don't know where the sound's no. coming from. We've got a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, now, this is quite a busy slide. And as Caroline said, we did talk about the history of Pythagoras' theorem last week, but we didn't look at this picture. But what you see is that this spans 5,000 years from the Egyptians right through to current time. And we haven't got any, any actual recorded dis writing about, from the Egyptians about Pythagoras' theorem. We have from the Babylonians, but not from the Egyptians. But, well, we believe, don't we, Caroline, that um, it's more than likely <laughs> that the Egyptians were well aware of it because in designing and building the pyramids, which were very precise, they had to have a knowledge of, of um, geometry, of triangles, even trigonometry. And yeah, and, and right angles, there's a lot of right angles in, in, in the pyramids. Yes, structure. yes. Yes, and to get the... Accurately. Yes, to get the um, the top of the pyramid, you know, accurately over the middle of the base, it doesn't happen by accident. No, which is why, even though there's nothing, we we have we have physical evidence, if not actual proof, that they they, they used it. And it looks as though they used it, even if they didn't have a name for it. They certainly wouldn't have called it Pythagoras, of course. What I love about this line, though, is that you look and it's three thousand before. The, um, the current era, BCE. So before, basically we're into 2000 BC. So that is going all the way back. It's more than 5,000 years ago that the pyramids were built and using the, the it, it, it's, Pythagoras' theorem isn't something that, that man invented. Pythagoras is something that man discovered and uses <laughs> to, to make our environment straight. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, um, yes, it, it, it is quite confusing. I mean, I I grew up with BC and AD, and it's now BCE and CE, isn't it? Oh, CE, so. yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't even know what, what it is now. Yes, I see it there, but I, I haven't got <laughs> it in my head yet. So before the current era and the current era. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So a lot of knowledge was uh, carried both ways, actually, along the... Um, trading routes, the what we call the what we call the Silk Route across uh, from uh, Ch China and India um, and through to the, to the, what the middle what we call the Middle East now and um, the Mediterranean and of course the sea routes as well, where there was a lot of trade over the centuries. Um, 
I must say, I think the truth is that um, in those uh, eras BCE, most of the knowledge weren't from uh, from um, east to west, rather than from west to east. <laughs> Um, although there was there was a passage of knowledge both That's ways, a I have to say. Yeah. Well, well, it was, it was certainly trading in both directions. Oh, was, absolutely. And 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 we did receive what I'm trying to say is we did receive a lot of information from India and China at that time. And what we see is that although the Babylonians had knowledge of Pythagoras' theorem, um, as you see from the um, clay tablets there and the inscriptions and we talked about those last week um, so did the Chinese but we didn't talk about the um, Indian um, mathematics and we will do that a little later today and we didn't we did mention Pythagoras uh, we did mention Fermat's last theorem which is similar to Pythagoras as you see up on the top right there um, which is that for a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n, there's only one possible value of n, and that's n equals 2, which gives you Pythagoras' theorem. And it's impossible to, to find a, b, and c, which obey that uh, formula, follow that formula for any other value of n. And that was only proved not very long ago. Um, in fact, within the last 10 years by Andrew Wiles. Um, but what we didn't talk about was the Fermat's... The Fermat's last theorem. Yes, indeed. Last because... Well, that's um, what they call Fermat's last theorem. So it yes, has indeed. not been proven yet. Because throughout my childhood, it was like Fermat's last a theorem. Nobody's been able to prove it. And it's such a simple concept, as you said the other day. It's a super simple concept. You can see the formula for, for, for a... Well, a to the n plus b to n is not equal to c to the n for n not equal to 2. Super simple to look at, but it took how many years? For the three hundred? Over three. Hundred years? Uh, 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 well, yes. No, it was even yes, four well over three, but he proved it. Yeah, well over three, nearly 400 years for somebody to yeah. actually prove it. And, and yeah, you had well, a story about that, Tony. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Well, all right, I, I'll I'll tell the story now. Oh, we can tell um, it Andrew, later. We can put everybody no, no. in suspense and tell, tell the story later. <laughs> no, no, no. You've introduced it, Caroline. Andrew was born in in Cambridge, actually, so he's well known here. Um, and he, the story is, he went to the local library as a boy of about twelve. He was very interested in maths at the time, and he. He was reading maths books that he found in the library and he read about Fermat's last theorem. Well, he'd learnt about Pythagoras' theorem and he thought this must be easy. And so he played around with it then when he was in his teens and tried to prove it because although he knew it hadn't been proved over these hundreds of years, he thought it couldn't be that difficult when it was so simple, as, as Caroline just said, to actually state it. And it was his life's ambition to prove the theorem. Okay, um, and he realised some, pe some people spent their whole lives attempting it and failing. So this is the, there was a possibility that he would not have succeeded. But just to fill that in, lots and lots and lots of people had attempted to prove it, hadn't they? Over the, over the well, he yes. I mean, along with you know his studies and then his job um, and other research, he tried and he didn't. And he was by this time he was coming to twenty years ago. He was um, a, a professor at Princeton University. And so he still hadn't proved it. <laughs> and so he, he shut him, this story is, and I think it's true, he shut himself in his room and it said for seven years. And of course he, you know, he, he went out to do the all normal things and, you know, and had meals with his family and that sort of thing. But he, he told everybody at Princeton that he was, you know, he was, he was going, he was working on this. And he, he, he actually, the story is he didn't do any other research or teaching. He just completely focused on this proof. 
And then there was a meeting in Cambridge, and I think it was about <clears throat> 2013, but I might be out by a year. Um, and he then, nobody knew he was going to do it, he then gave a lecture in which he announced his proof, which he'd done, okay? And I went to a, my husband and I went to a party that evening and he was there and everybody was so excited. It was like the most amazing party you can imagine, given by the head of department, John Coates, who's himself a number theorist. And, you know, people were just, oh, wow. However, subsequently, some glitches were found in the proof so it was another couple of years before it was finally published and everybody around the world was then aware that it actually had been proved but it is very difficult and it took a couple of years even to sort it out even though Andrew had proved it as I say there were a couple of details they were almost but they were important um, that needed to be to be solved. So, so that's the story. And now I'm I'm really ho quite horrified because I thought, well, horrified, a bit strong. But I mean, I had always thought of of Andrew as quite a young man. But I now realise he's seventy this year. <laughs> so he's not Thank quite so young. With me. <laughs> not, not anymore. Yeah, they catch up with you eventually, don't they, Tony? Yeah, yes, indeed. I'll catch up anyway, with you soon. Any Anyway, let's let's go on. Um, oh, I just haven't mentioned yet why we've got this map in um, the lower uh, map of the two, which shows you North Africa and Spain and Portugal there in in sort of yellow, and and then there's various shades of uh, sort of red colours, and that is that is the Islamic culture as it spread. Um, through North Africa and up into um, up into Europe, um, and that brought into Europe a great amount of learning from um, the Islamic culture, and then that that eventually has came through to the rest of Europe. So the rest of Europe were well behind at the time. And when the, um, what we call the Moors, in fact, the, um, the people from uh, uh, the cent uh, Central and um, Middle East, um, and these, these people who, who come across, these um, Muslims who come across and taken over Spain, what's now Spain and Portugal, when they were driven out of Spain and Portugal, in fact, they were invited to the Vatican. Some of the scholars were invited to the Vatican to, 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 to give lectures on, on um, the mathematics that they knew and uh, uh, astronomy and science that they knew that wasn't known in the rest of Europe because um, we were the rest, well, we, the, the Pope and actually, and the leaders of, of the um, Europe, of Europe were, were worried that we would lose um, quite a, a lot of um, that precious knowledge, which we hadn't actually, you know, we just needed to know. <laughs> so they brought it into Europe. They brought a lot of knowledge of mathematics into Europe. And that's, that's, uh, not so generally known, but it is a really important. So, what we're going, what we're still talking about, is this this theorem that's named after Pythagoras, but was known um, thousands of years before Pythagoras and used. And it states that um, when you have a right angle triangle, the area which is C squared, if the edge, the hypotenuse of the triangle is C, is equal to the sum of the areas A squared plus B squared of the squares on the other two sides. So that's Pythagoras' theorem. Um, now, this rule was known to ancient civilizations, including the Indians and the Chinese and, and the and the Greeks, and was recorded in Mesopotamia as far back as um, 1800 BCE. But actually, it's 
who discovered it? Um, well, it can't reliably be re accredited to one person or even to one culture. We're not really sure who was first. Yeah, it doesn't. It, it, what's, what's interesting is that one imagines that, well, one imagines it might not be true. It could have been one person first, but it'll be that the, the standing on the, the shoulders of giants that came before you, it'll be somebody in one culture and then sharing something and then, and then it growing and people having realizations and taking it in a different direction or further in a different culture. So it's probably a, a, a group effort, I would have said, a team effort would be my guess. Well, yeah, I'm sure you're right. And in fact, interestingly, it's the converse of Pythagoras' theorem that was widely used, which was um, that the um, if you've got the, sum, the square on the hypotenuse equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides, then it's a right angle. So to get an accurate right angle, people made instruments that were actually obeying that rule. So, or used rope, but uh, more likely they had a what we call a set square. So, it, it, the fact that I they were say, actually I about it, a set square is typically a set square is typically well, they would have to be. But are they are they set to to, to work linearly on that? As in, it must well. It, it must have. A, if it has a right oh. angle, then it must be. It must obey Pythagoras. You know. If, if it has a right angle, I'm wondering if it's if it actually is that they do the measure. No, you know, like so that it's integers, integer length. Oh, oh is, well, I, never said, uh, I don't know. It probably isn't. I'm probably just. Well, imagining. it might not be integer lengths, Caroline, uh, in uh, every set square, but. Um, that is what was that we, the, there is evidence that the early civilizations used um, what we call the Pythagorean triples, which is integer lengths. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so this this is a picture here of um, <laughs> a, a, yes, a, a sort of quite an imaginative one with this colourful sky behind him and his robes. He's in orange, like you, Caroline. <laughs> yes, I, li I like the orange, but I'm a bit I'm, I'm a bit um, horrified by his use of Pythagoras. Well, yeah, yes. So <laughs> I don't know if I want to be associated with this one. <laughs> oh well, I'm surprised. Why? I mean, he so he what he, lived... he used it for. Well, he, he, you, oh, I see. Well, he, he, um, yes, he lived around 800 BCE, but even there, it's not, it's not very clear um, exactly which year he was born in and when he died. Um, but he wrote a lot of mathematics um, and um, he, his um, body honors, Silver Sutras were sort of beat the geometry um, of Vedic mathematics, and uh, he recorded a, a lot of really important uh, information and ideas there. And and there's a quote, uh, a translation of what one of the things he, he wrote was that the rope stretched along the length of the diagonal of a rectangle. Imagine it from the picture there. Right, makes an area, and it must mean it's the area of that square on that at length BD. Mm, that's what we think, yeah. Which the vertical and horizontal sides make together, and it must mean that they that is the um, vertical side AD and the, and the, the area of that square and the square on the horizontal side a a b um so that is how it was conceived and written um by modhayana and he was a mathematician a I priest love... and an architect sorry i love the fact that he starts with a rectangle and that's um an interesting insight that the diagonal of a rectangle is could be is a nice starting point for, for a square base, a square. Yes, and the, a right yes, and the, yeah, 
That's right. Now, um, these, as I said, these Sulba Sutras were appendices to the Vedas. And Vedic mathematics is still really important in, in India, isn't it? And it, mm. it, it, it is a similar to the mathematics of the rest of the world. But as it was developed, it's slight, the emphasis is slightly different and the way it's expressed is slightly different in Vedic mathematics. Or it, Indians might tell you it's, it's very different. Um, it, uh, uh, but um, yes, uh, it wasn't just um, Hindu. It, well, originally, I think it was written in Sanskrit. But it's not, it's not just the Hindus, also the Buddhists shared in this Vedic mathematics and all the scholarship around that. But they're certainly very keen to spread the, 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 the knowledge, the system, the method used in Vedic mathematics. They, they stay, so it's definitely worth investigating uh, that if you're interested because apparently it does simplify or make I'm not quite sure what, what it, like, for example, multiplication, it, it, long multiplication, it helps people. I think there are, uh, I think there are lots of ways of doing multiplication and other yeah. forms of calculation. And, uh, and I think there are ways in Vedic mathematics that, um, you know, that, that are quite neat and, um, and, and a little bit different. Anyway, this, what's this is a bit that, that, that creeped me out about this. Mathematician, priest, and architect. The bit, the worrying part is the priest. Oh well, I see. Go on, Tony. Um, <laughs> well, well they kept in altars and with ritual sacrifices. That meant they were killing things on these altars. They were using the Pythagoras, the the, the, <laughs> the Pythagoras principle, to actually make very precise altars so that they could kill things. So that's the thing that creeps me out. Oh, I see. <laughs> they have to be see. very precise, and they, there's no room for error, so they have to be super, absolutely precise. So they use mathematics for it, but it's it's those things that religion do, you know, that where they have to kill things to appease the gods and things, and I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, um be it as it may, I, I suppose sometimes they they put the the um, the products of their um, industry there, their farming or whatever. But uh, no, I think you're right. Actually, they. Well, but actually, Caroline, if you're going to slaughter a beast to eat it, you, is it worse to slaughter it to sacrifice it on an altar? Okay, if it, I suppose if you're going to eat it and it's a, a, a food, that, a creature that you eat, then. I suppose fine. Uh, uh, I think if we uh, if we eat meat, then we really shouldn't um, be critical of, of in the, in perhaps of other people who, for the reasons you've just stated. Anyway, <laughs> right. let's yeah, look. Fair, let's fair look enough. at this. Let's look at this diagram. Okay, so now you see a diagram which is described, I believe, in the Sobal Sutras as a way of finding the area of a triangle, uh, sorry, of a, a square that's equal to the sum of the areas of two smaller squares. So it, it's again, it's Pythagoras' theorem, isn't it? So mm -hmm. what, yeah. you, what you do is you, you have the two smaller squares, A, B, C, D, and P, Q, R, S, and um, along the edge of one of, of, of one of these sides, along the edge PQ, you mark PX, which is the same length as AB. So yep. that length is um, one of the, uh, the edges of the smaller square, as it were. Okay. And the other edge, PS, is the length of the edge of the larger square. And so you yep. have... Sx as uh, well, you have that triangle PSX, mm -hmm. and there's a square on the hypotenuse, and um, that is as, as was stated by Bodhayan, which is again equivalent of Pythagoras' theorem. This in its area, the area of um, 
S, Z, Y, X, or S, X, Y, Z, is the sum of the areas of the other two squares. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that's a different sort of, slightly different way of uh, referring to Pythagoras' theorem. Now, some of the information here comes from the maths history from St. Andrews. But if you look, um, Bard Hayana and the Subba Sultras, up on the um, internet, you'll find a lot more information. And you'll find information about Vedic mathematics if you're interested. So I just want us to think a bit about these Pythagorean triples that we met last week. There are infinitely many of them. Um, what are they? The integers a, b, and c such that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And we find so point out that there are infinitely many triples out of integers. So sometimes you find there's a limited in, in, in some combination because we specify in integers, but this is integers. So in other words, if they're not whole numbers, you know, there's an, well, still an infinite amount of them, but um, this is with integers, infinite amount of them. I, I love it. Right. And, and These yes, are Pythagorean yes. triples, and it's a somewhat yeah. surprising result. And the way you find it, as we discussed last time, is that you just take any two integers you like, m and n, and then the hypotenuse, c squared, will be m squared plus n squared. The uh, shorter sides will be m squared minus n squared and 2mn. So here's an example. If m and n are 2, m squared plus n squared is 4 plus 1, which is 5. That's c squared. And m squared minus n squared is 3. Um, and three, um, 2mn is 4. So that gives you a 3, 4, 5 triangle with integer edge lengths. And if you take m is 3 and n is 2, you get... Um, 3 squared plus 2 squared is 9 plus 4 is 13. 3 squared minus 2 squared is 9 minus 4, which is 5. And 2mn gives you your 12. And there it is. And these are roughly to scale. So that's so th the third for, one. For, for any two positive integers, any. So it could be 1 and 100,000 billion. Yeah, any two, you can you can use this um, formula, uh, uh, these formulae, and and you can generate a Pythagorean triple. Wow. Well, it is nice, isn't it? That was, that was a big surprise to me. That that's that was a huge surprise to me. If you'd asked me how many do you think there are, I'd have assumed number one that was a limited amount, and it. I, yeah, and I love the fact that you can actually calculate it. You, you've got any two positive integers and you can work out what the third, what, well, no, not what the third, you can work out A, B and C. Love it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Now then, this is a, a you can, so we just said, you, so that means you can draw infinitely many right angle triangles with integer edge lengths. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a theorem, not his last theorem, but what's called Fermat's right triangle theorem. And here he's saying it's not possible for the all the four lengths now, A, B, C, D, to be integers. If you join two right angle triangles, as you see in the diagram. Now, what you, you have... The the, hypotenuse against, against one of the, 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 the non-hypotenuse. One the of the legs. You're doing that. He calls and it a leg. Mm. A, a leg, okay, one of the legs at the end. And so that's, so his theory is it's not possible for them all to be integers. You can't have A, B, C, and D being integers. We know that B, D, and A can be integers. We know that D, B, and C could be integers, but then the A wouldn't be an integer or the C wouldn't be an integer. It wouldn't fit. It wouldn't fit. Yeah. Wouldn't and because fit. you've got an infinite supply of, of right angle triangles, which we just agreed, mm -hmm. you might think that it would be possible from that infinite supply to mm -hmm. find two that you could match up like this. And it's but not, not a difficult. 
but it's not possible and it's not a difficult proof that it's impossible okay. um and so it's a sort of surprising result however okay now, again the sperm that dude is um did some very had a lot of insight there yes and now this is um andrew wiles uh, about Andrew Wiles and Fermat's last theorem, and there it's another um, another incident incidence of that it's not something is not possible, okay, and again it's something that you would think might be likely to be possible, but it, because obviously you can try any value of n and there are infinitely many of them, but it's not you can't find anything except n equals two for which that formula is 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 right it works so, so it's there you are too it's simple with, with Fermat, wasn't it he was if he made the statement that, that he's making he didn't well everyone has the onus of proof you won't accept something in mathematics without it but he's making the negative statements which kind of is also simpler to state yeah and but anyway so he, these are two theorems that without Proving it to, to me, the, the, yeah. the first one, the, the right angle theorem, is just, and he was right. I love it. Okay, keep going. Sorry. Well, these two are, are, are theorems, both by, you know, uh, originated from Fermat, but and he, in both cases, he said something wasn't possible, but he did prove one and not the other. Yeah. Okay. And he did prove the one about the right angle triangle. Cool. Right. So now we're going to talk about a jigsaw. It's a lovely jigsaw. It's one of my favorites. Simple, okay. Um, there's only seven pieces and there, there are only four different shapes. Okay, well, uh, the squares and triangles, but the four triangles are all the same and the squares are different sizes, okay. But there's something special about the squares. So, the green square is exactly the same edge length as the shortest edge of the, of the triangle. Right, okay, yeah. There's um, the four blue triangles and the green square matches the their, yeah. their, um, congruent triangles and the green square matches the shortest length of, of course, all four triangles because they're congruent. Okay, okay, we've got that clear. Uh, Car Carolina, I wondered if you were going to demonstrate this. Have you got your visualizer up and running oh, or not? Um, Never mind. Never mind. We can just talk about not... it. Sorry. Next time, next time we'll do another puzzle, a uh, different one, and you can you can demonstrate it on the visualizer. Okay. Absolutely. With, 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 with pleasure. I've got with my pieces. Nice sorted out. Pieces, I, I knew yes. you got, got these pieces. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. I guess because you did them with your class, didn't you? Did this this particular um, jigsaw with your class? And by the way, as you as is noted there, it is uh, was originally uh, this is adapted a little bit, but not much. It's really as it was um, given in this Chinese manuscript about two hundred years BCE. That's okay, amazing. so the orange square, okay, the edge length of the orange square <clears throat> is exactly matching to the long, the, the um, middle length of the, the longer leg, if you like, of let's the right that, angle triangle. Let's call that B square, because all, <laughs> the green one would be the a, an A square and the, the gold one would be the B square. Okay. Yeah, you don't need to algebraize it, no, Caroline, exactly. but you can. Right. We've, been no, no, we've been talking about it. Yes. So, no, yeah. Okay. So and the, the, it. But if you do facilitate this with young learners, that what Tony says is do not mention Pythagoras at all until you get to the final conclusion, which we will lead you to. Yeah. Even if they've over. even. And that's true whether or not they've met Pythagoras before, because if yeah. they have met it before, it then is revision. And if they haven't, they will actually discover something they never didn't know about, but they will discover it. So if the pink one, the pink square, well, obviously that one 
as the other two match the lengths, that one must match the length. So the jigsaw puzzle is about putting these pieces together, okay? And it's called the make squares puzzle. And the two challenges here, one of them is to find five pieces, not all of them, with five pieces making a square, okay? <laughs> Fitting the edges together, matching the edges. And the other challenge is to fit six of these pieces together to make a square. So it's move the pieces round. You can match the edges, make a square. Imagine it. Okay. And, and there are three solutions. The five-piece solution takes the biggest of the squares, the pink one, and puts those copies, those four identical triangles around the edge, and it makes a square. And that square will fit into the frame that's drawn below. It will fit exactly into the frame. Now we have two different six piece solutions here. Um, spot the difference. Well, just differences of the other two. Oh, the difference between the, the pink one and the green and gold one. No, difference between solutions two and three. Difference between solutions two and three. It uses the same pieces. They're just in different configuration. Well, the orange and green squares are clearly in different places. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and you make rectangles now with the blue, with each with a pair of blue, blue triangles. Right, yeah. And, but they're both, in that respect, they're both the same. Solutions two and three have two rectangles made from the blue triangles. But I suppose yes. that's the only way I can see where you can actually make a square using those two smaller squares. Yes. And again, all three solutions, of course, eat one, one at a time, will fit into the frame. So, what can you so deduce? They're all the same size, but they are congruent. The, the shape that they make, the square that they well, make. Well, the area, we, yeah. Now, let's think about areas. The areas, the area inside the frame is going to be the same. And so, mm -hmm. what can you deduce from the three solutions? Well, put the f solution one, the five-piece solution, into the frame mm -hmm. and remove four blue triangles. What have you got left? One pink square. And that is the area that's covered up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of doing that, put solution two in, okay, into the frame mm -hmm. and then remove the four blue triangles. Mm -hmm. And what have you got left? Two squares, but you're removing the exact same area both times, even though they they make one makes one. Is, you're removing four triangles from both, and they are congruent triangles. So you're removing the same area both times, which so the area left of the green and the orange must be the same as the area of the pink square. Yeah. yeah. And whether you do that with solution two or solution three, um, it's the area is the same. The area is so so you you it's if you do this with a class of 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 um, teenagers uh, even 12 year olds even 11 year olds um, and you ask them what they notice and you sort of ask key questions you know what do you notice about the areas what's you know what's still covered up in that frame um, some of the, uh, the, the learners in the class will say oh the, the area of the pink square must be the same as the area of the green and orange put together and you will always get ch some children who will spot it and then the others will say, oh, yes. <laughs> um, and then if they have never met Pythagoras' theorem before, then you should really warmly congratulate them. Say, They're great. how wonderful you've discovered this theorem. And it's a really f 
really important theorem. Okay, and if they have met it before, you can. Uh, they may recognise without prompting that it is Pythagoras' theorem, but you, you know, they'll soon realise that it is Pythagoras if they met Pythagoras before. Now, of course, it's not. It's not really a proof because this this fit might not be a hundred percent accurate. There might be a tiny little difference, you know, um, but. Um, I wouldn't sow any seeds of doubt like that. And when they're older, they can actually make, turn this into a formal proof. So this is actually what people call a proof without words. You know, it's, it's, if you think about it, it seems pretty obvious. But if you have to write it down, then it needs, it, because of the conventions, the agreements between mathematicians, you need to state it quite carefully. Um, and that can be done. That can be done. Okay, so let's let, let's move on. Um, now, before they ever meet Pythagoras' theorem, students should do the puzzle and find these solutions for themselves and talk about them. Now, that's my you know that's what I think should happen if possible. And so. With guided discussion in which the teacher asks the key questions, the students will notice that if the four triangles are removed from each arrangement, then the areas in the frame still covered must be equal. We discuss that. And okay, so there they are. And then, oh, in fact, if you look around the classroom, what different learners have done, what I just briefly gave you a glimpse of will be that there might be other solutions that apparently look different that different children in the class have got. Not just the ones you see here, but slightly different right. solutions. And that's great because okay. that, that, that's something that needs to be discussed as well. Because some learners might have got one that, one that is called solution one, but what about the solution underneath it? Is it the same solution? Mm -hmm. Well, spot the difference between solution one and the one underneath it. Solution one, the one underneath it, it's 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 flipped. It's yes, not, it's you not could either imagine no matter which way you turn it round, it's still different. It's still the same but different no. to solution one. It's not the same as solution one, it's the same as itself, but different to solution one. So yes. it's flipped, it's flipped over, it's like the mirror image of it. Yes. So if you, exactly. And both of them have rotational symmetry of order four. You can, as you can turn them round and fit them four ways. And they, but, but as Caroline's just said, one's a mirror image of the other. Now that is something that the learners in the class might, might observe, but actually for the purposes of uh, what we're doing, we're going to say that, the, set, the one below is a repeat or it's equivalent to the solution one above. Now look at solution four. Is that different from solution two and solution three, for example? I'm sorry, solution, oh, solution four, solution three. Okay, oh, sorry, sorry, I was assuming solution four was the second pink one. I see it now, it's down below. Okay, solution four, that is similar, using the English term similar, to solution two, but the diagonals are different on one. Let me see. Oh, yeah, it's flipped over. It, the diagonals are, number one, the diagonals are different. Number two, it is, some of it's reflected, some of it's a mirror image, and some of it's it's just different. Well, what the configuration what is similar, but the way way that the triangles are placed is different. 
That's right. When Caroline's talking about the diagonals of the rectangles, what she means is that the two blue squares have been placed differently together to form the same rectangle, but, to, but the blue squares are differently placed. The and blue so. Triangle. Yes. Sorry, so, four. So, solution four is a variant, variation, or a repeat, or an equivalent of solution two. Okay, so Looks equivalent. Like. we can call it an equivalent. Okay, yeah. What about solution nine? Solution six is oh, solution nine. Solution nine looks similar. Solution three because it's got an L shape. The triangles form an L shape as do they with solution six. So if you couldn't see the diagonals of the diagonals of the triangles, we can see that all three are actually make different. Um, yeah, their, their configuration is different. Yes, I mean, if you were just looking at the rectangles and you couldn't see the, where the triangles were there, then solutions three six and nine would all seem the same but they are you can spot now that they they're actually um variations but um they sort of in some ways uh, belong together so as a group of activity as a group activity students will as we said they'll find some of these variations around the class um, we're calling them equivalents, and they could name them after the students who found them. You know, one of them could be Caroline's. So what's called solution one could be Caroline's solution, all right? And the one underneath it could be Tony's solution. And then we'd say, well, really, they're two versions of the same solution. And solution two, um, solution four, you might name them after Peter and Mary in the class. Um, it, well, it's just one possibility you might do. But the point is that the children can then take ownership of them and say, oh, I found that one. He, yours looks a bit different, but it's actually equivalent to mine. That's one of those lovely poster activities, isn't it? Get all the possibilities up on a poster and you can name them according to the first person that discovered it. Yes. As you say, and that's on the poster. Yeah, you could make a poster with, with the variations. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we'll look at that in a minute. So there's a, this is an opportunity for students to revise what they know about reflections and rotations. So not all, only can they revise about Pythagoras' theorem if they've met it before, uh, but uh, whether or not they've met Pythagoras' theorem, this is an opportunity to think about reflections and rotations. And it comes naturally. You don't have to find all of the uh, possible possibilities. You can just look at the ones the children around the classroom have found. Um, and they could look at different variations if, if you have the time and see how many they can find. So what about these? How many fractions are there? Yeah. Are there? Two, four, six, eight fractions. No, I don't know what to. Are they all four, different? Six, I see eight fractions. Are they different? Three, six, let's see. Five, 50 over 100 is a half, so that's equivalent to that one. Oh, you mean they are equivalent, some of them. Let me see. 75 over 100 is three quarters. 15 over 20 is three quarters. 7 over 14 is a half, 21 over 28, now that's a bit different, 3 over 6 is a half, 21 over 28, so that would be 3 quarters again, 3 quarters, oh that's 3 quarters again, okay so there's only 2 fractions there. Absolutely. And and the, right. So what we're saying about the fractions there is similar to what we're saying about the um, about the solutions of this puzzle. There are, but in fact, fractions have infinitely many equivalent forms, don't they? I mean, we can write a half in infinitely many different ways. 
<laughs> as long as the number on the bottom or the denominator is 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 double the number on the, in the numerator. Um, so, but but these solutions to the puzzle, actually, there are a finite number. You could find them all. You could you could you could put them all on a poster. So let's have a look at them. So um, we've already discussed that. These, as Caroline said earlier, they're either uh, the two versions of the same thing or equivalent, and with uh, one's a reflection of the other. Now, here are all the other ways that you can put the triangles into those other two shapes with the six-piece solution. There are exactly eight different ways you can do it. Now, they all do look the same, but spot the difference. Solutions two, three, and four four and five are distinct solutions, although they all look alike at, at a first glance. But the difference is the way the blue triangles are fitted into those rectangles. And similarly mm -hmm. with six, seven, eight, and nine. So. Right, so the, the, tri the triangles have got the same four variations but because the squares are in different position, it's four different. Yeah. Um, so salute. Very. So, so it, if you look Go at ahead. solutions two and three, they're symmetric. There's a sort of, yeah, okay. and the others are not symmetric when you consider where the blue, where the triangles are placed, and and so mm -hmm. so they only have four variations, whereas solutions four or five. Uh, sorry, solutions. Um, Yes, four, five, six, seven, and eight. They have eight variations each, and that all makes fifty-six variations in all. So, um, actually, uh, you, some pe um, really perceptive people might have uh, already noticed that we've changed the numbering a little bit from the very first time we looked at these solutions, and this is. To assist this classification, I've numbered these solutions one to nine like this. So there's solution two, and notice it's symmetric, and there are, if that solution rotated by 90 degrees, by 180 degrees, and by um, 270 or 90 degrees um, anti-clockwise, that's solu four variations of solution two, and you see see four similar okay. variations of solution three but so these are equivalent to equivalent fractions in the sense that they're they belong but together what, yeah i'm not i'm not sure that they belong together they, yeah. they're, they're equivalent to each other right you haven't yeah. got four distinct s solutions there um with solution two and another four with solution three you've got variations on the same one and here, with solution four, notice here there are eight variations of that because there are also reflections of all of the di different. When you reflect it, when you reflect solutions two and three, because they're symmetrical, you get a copy of the same thing. But when you reflect solutions, solution four, um, you get something that looks different, and and there you have eight different, um, eight different versions of that. So the first four are solution four that's got the number in it, um, rotated. So you see the the smaller square, the, the green one, appears first in the bottom right corner, then in the bottom left corner, then in the top left corner, then in the top right corner as you rotate it. Right, yeah. And the um, ones on the right um, are reflections of, uh, so this one here, if you can see my cursor, yeah. is a right. reflection of the one that's got the number four in it. And then, okay. and then these are all rotations of, of this one. Or you can um, you can name where the, the the axis for the rotation, but they're all reflections of this one that's numbered four. 
Okay. Now, I'm not saying that in a class you'd want to make a poster with all of these on. You might feel you hadn't the time. You might think it was a little bit obsessional to want to find them all. But some children would, would actually really like doing that. And, it, and it's, it's certainly a possibility. And it's certainly, um, oh, I found my, my eyes sort of almost going squint-eyed trying to <laughs> setting, doing all these pictures. But, it's, yeah. um, but here they are. Now, we've only got up to number four. Um, that one, by the way, is one of the ones that appeared um, uh, in, in, in the beginning. Um, uh, and now we've got solutions five and six and all the variation of those, variations Again. of those. Again, eight variations of each one. <laughs> and solutions seven, eight and nine. Again, eight variations of each one um, yep. and I promise you <laughs> they are all different <laughs> in some <Yeah>. sense <laughs> they are all different in I some believe sense you. <laughs> yeah so I've written here at the top it is an activity to revise Pythagoras' theorem and transformations at the same time <laughs> so it's a rich activity. It's got plenty of potential. And it's really important when you're uh, teaching. Um, some of you may not be teachers, but you may have children and you may think about, you know, their experience in school. It's really important that they can get their hands on things and actually try and not just listen to the teacher and then do repetitive exercises. Um, but actually, especially if they're given the opportunity to investigate and discover something, uh, the maths becomes much more meaningful as, as well as more, more interesting. Yeah, they get a lot more ideas of other things they can do with maths when they're doing an activity like this. Mm. Mm. That mm. engages them much more in the maths, the maths of the maths in the subject itself. Now, we've got... Many. I mean, there are about were 371 proofs of Pythagoras' theorem, apparently, different, subtly no. different from each other. Um, it's not infinity. <laughs> no. They were published in a book in 1927, and there are more different proofs um, wow. as well. So, But we, we're going to concentrate in the next few weeks on the jigsaws. And um, the way some proofs that, you know, are what I referred to as proofs without words. And next week, Caroline will have a visualizer and she'll show you uh, how the pieces of the jigsaw are put together. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll be doing something similar to today, but with different stories to tell about it. And um, a di definitely a different puzzle. Um, and uh, I do think that they make a really good way for children to, uh, young people to um, explore um, uh, mathematics, think about how to prove ideas and to, um, uh, to revise things like Pythagoras' theorem by looking at them in a completely different way. And, and it makes it a lot easier to visualise it as well because you can then picture these pictures and oh yeah the two little ones smaller ones as the, their squares added but it's, it's the same as the square of the big ones it really helps to have that for me anyway to have the visual image as you see here on our last slide so it's almost time to say goodbye <laughs> um, it is time to, we've just got enough time to say goodbye so um next week with more pythagoras more puzzles and are we doing more history next week or are we done? Oh, yes. I mean, there's, yes, there's more stories to tell and more ideas because these uh, puzzles that we're going to, um, one of them's by Leonardo da Vinci, by the way. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. So we'll talk about, and I mean, you know, that wasn't proved yesterday. <laughs> no, exactly. And we, so we're, we're going to tell a little bit of a story about each one um, and 
in its time uh, when uh, there's one that was proved by Einstein when he was 12 apparently now actually he didn't do very well at school at all but he was obviously very bright yeah no, that's surprising because yeah the, the story is he didn't do well he wasn't he, well I don't know if he wasn't academic but he didn't do well and yet he yeah, well he, I think he I well. think he I think he probably was academic. He just he just didn't cooperate very well. <laughs> yeah, he just probably thought they were all idiots. <laughs> He's a bit like, like leave me alone and let me do my mathematics. Well, I don't I don't know that that was even the case. He was probably a bit like Winston Churchill, who did very badly at school, but was really quite um, a, a cultured and 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 an, an intellectual. And wrote lots of books about history as well as being a politician. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, but he didn't probably. do well at school either. Yeah, um, and that maybe that was just. There's a lot of memorization back then, wasn't it? It's pretty much purely memorization and repetition. So probably just. Mm -hmm. Bored, most likely. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Mind other anyway, anyway, I think it's six o'clock here and time to say goodbye. I think it's six o'clock here too. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Same time, same place.